Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you. Glad you are with us tonight and hope that you are ready for another study from God's Word. We're going to put our content information up here for you so you can uh, reach us. A Word from the Lord at gmail.com or 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. We meet at <clears throat> 250 the Boulevard in Eden and we hope that you will come out and visit with us. Study God's Word. Uh, right now we're going through, on Thursday night, we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians. And so we are uh, studying from that. So we hope that you will come out and study God's Word with us. We are uh, always interested in individuals who are looking for the truth and uh, wanting to study God's Word. We want to, want to uh, know that you'll have a warm welcome uh, anytime that you want to come out and study with us. Uh, as, as Caleb mentioned, 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville. And 120 American Legion in Danville is where you can study God's Word with uh, the brethren uh, in those particular towns. And so if you're close by, please uh, take advantage of those opportunities. Tonight, I want to talk about your preferences. You know, we read a lot about preferences in our society. We are uh, bombarded with uh, uh, the idea of uh, preferences as far as what people like and don't like, and, and uh, sometimes preferences are uh, thrust upon us by other people that we don't particularly care for. Uh, we have people that are talking about, well, they prefer to be called women, they prefer to be called men, they're identifying as different types of individuals, and so they're telling us what their preferences are, what they want to be called or how they want to be identified. <clears throat> Tonight I want to start off by showing you a headline from a newspaper uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, I guess it was last month in December. And uh, it had a very interesting title to it because the thing is, we're going to be talking about some individuals who prefer to be called one thing, even though that's not really what they are. And I find it interesting that people want to be called one thing when that's really not what they are. Here's the, here's the headline. The KKK prefers separatists. They prefer to be called separatists. The article goes on to say that uh, the over the the uh, the the subheadline says the overtly racist group disavows white supremacist label. So they don't want to be called white supremacists. They want to. They prefer to be called separatists. We just want to be separate from all other races. That's what they want now. Well, what they prefer to be called and what they are may be two different things. You know, I know I can understand preferring to be called uh, something as opposed to other things. Uh, sometimes people call me Jim. I, I prefer James. That's my name. But sometimes people, they, <clears throat> they'll call you nicknames or they'll call you by a name that maybe you, you don't use. And uh, sometimes when I uh, meet someone, and then I find out they're called something different or people call them something different. I say, well, what do you prefer to be called? Because apparently you have a name that you prefer over another name, so I want to call you what you prefer if it's, if it's your given name or nickname. And so, uh, uh, you know, your preference matters to me. But when it comes to something that is contrary to what you really are, I don't really want, I don't really concern, I'm really concerned about your preference. In other words, if you are a man, but you prefer to be called a woman, I'm not going to call you a woman. I'm going to call you a man. I'm going to say he. I'm going to say, you know, you use masculine terms, Mr. or whatever, because that's what you are. Whatever you prefer is not really uh, important as opposed to what you really are. And so when the KKK says they prefer this, I find it interesting that, <clears throat> that people would uh, want to prefer something that's contrary to what they are. For example, here is what their creed says. Now, this is the, this is the Ku Klux Creed, <clears throat> and it's from the, I think it's, um, I don't know if it's in their Quran, I think it's their holy book or whatever, I don't know. Everything starts with a K with them. But the, clue, the Ku Klux Creed, this is what it says. Here's, here's a, this is like the third paragraph in their creed. It says, we avow, the distinction between the races of mankind as same has been decreed by the Creator, and we shall ever be true in the faithful maintenance of, now watch it, white supremacy 
and will strenuously oppose any compromise thereof in any and all things. So they avow there's a distinction and they avow their, their uh, faithful maintenance of white supremacy. But the headline says they disavow, they disavow white supremacists. But their creed says that they avow a distinction and they're, they're faithful in the maintenance of white supremacy. <clears throat> so their creed says this is what they are, but they prefer to be identified as a more, uh, what, uh, benign term. They prefer to be called something a little less uh, edgy. They prefer to be called something a little uh, less, uh, uh, what, uh, caustic, like white supremacy, they prefer they prefer just separatists. That sounds so nice, doesn't it? Separatist. We, we, we're just separatists. We just really want to be a part. We don't really we don't really want to be called white supremacists, even though that's what we are. Now, friends, we see this. We can understand that this is <clears throat> this is a classic example of people wanting to be called one thing, when and denying what they really are. But you know what? If you can see this with the Q Klux Klan and what they write in their Q Klux Creed. Well, what about other individuals? What about other individuals? Shouldn't we identify people by what they really are and call them by what they really are, even though they may prefer something else? I tell you what, I think the religious world prefers to be called one thing that's different from what they really are. Now, let me just show you this. <clears throat> Here, I apologize for this. Didn't mean to cover that up. Let me just, uh, let me see here. Let me just get this out of the way for us. This is a headline uh, from the Pope. It says, One World Religion. Pope Francis says all major religions are Quote, meeting God in different ways. We are all the children of God. Now, what does that sound like? Sounds to me like a very large unity movement, right? Everybody's included. We're all in inclusive. We're including everybody, not excluding anybody. Boy, that sounds, that sounds fine, doesn't it? That sounds wonderful. Everybody's all together. We're all just, we're all children of God. Doesn't matter who you are. Well, that shouldn't surprise us that the Pope would say that, uh, even though the, the previous Pope, the Pope right before that, uh, before him, I think Pope, whatever his name is, uh, Benedict or whatever, said that the, 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 the Catholic Church was the true church. Well, here's the next Pope comes along, and I don't know, I guess Jesus changed his mind since they, they claim to be uh, the, the vicar of Christ. So one Jesus said one thing, and another Jesus says another thing. Uh, they're really not... They're really not Jesus. But it shouldn't surprise you because notice what the rest of the religious world says. Here is what Billy Graham says when asked about uh, all people, the all-inclusive nature of God. Here's what he says. of it or not. They're members of the body of Christ. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people for, out of the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. Uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have and they turn to the only light that they have and I think that they are saved and they're going to be with us in heaven. This is fantastic. I'm so thrilled to hear you say that. There is a wideness in God's mercy. There is. Yeah, wideness in God's mercy. We're going to include everybody. You, you, uh, you, you, know, you know about God even though you may not have a, 
have a, a conscience of it. What is that? How can you know something and not know it? All right? And so here he is, Billy Graham, including everybody. It doesn't matter, Muslim, whatever. God is calling people, and they don't even know the name of Jesus. Well, see what it is, what we're talking about. We're talking about bringing everybody together. Everybody, oh, we just all love God. But you know what, friends? I believe, I believe that what they're doing is they want to be identified as unifiers. They want to, to be the, the, uh, um, the picture of, yeah, we're all in this together. We're all just seeking unity. We all love God. We're all children of God. And everything's, you know, roses and unicorns and rainbows and, and everything's fine and dandy. They prefer to be seen as one kind of individual or one group of people. They prefer to be seen as a certain type of people, but in reality, they're not. And here's why. Because, friends, if they were really seeking unity, they would be doing things the way the Bible says. Now, I want you to, I want you to uh, stay with me here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18, I want you to notice something about biblical unity. Now, if these individuals all claim to be unifying and all claim to be coming together and all claim to be one and, and loving everybody and, and so forth, then they need to see what the Bible says about unity. And if we look, and we're going to look at what the Bible says, and then we're going to look at what they say, and really what you're going to find, friends, is they're really, they're really kind of like the KKK in, in one respect. In respect of they want to be called or seen as one kind of person, which in, in reality, they're a different kind of person. But here's what biblical unity says. Biblical unity is what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. And he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, but ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, and in the same judgment. Now, no divisions is what Paul said. Now, from the very outset, when someone says, well, I want to be unified, I want to, I want to be all one with everybody, then right off the bat, you ought to say, well, why are there any divisions then? When Paul said, no divisions, same mind, same judgment, speak the same thing, mind the same thing, no divisions. Now, if we're trying to fulfill what Jesus prayed for, and that is unity, then it's going to come through the way Jesus said it would come. And that is through the word. In John 17, verse, John 17, verses uh, 20 and 21, Jesus said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they... May uh, uh, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, if we're supposed to be unifying, and we're supposed to bring the world together by our unity, then there has to be no divisions. But, in the religious world that claims to be following Jesus, there's all kinds of divisions. Unity is going to come through the word that God gave Christ, that Christ gave the apostles, that the apostles uh, recorded for us, and we have right here in God's Word. Unity is only going to come from this book, friends. So if I'm saying, if, if I'm hearing people say, talk about unity, and we're all God's children, we're all being accepted by God, there's a wideness to God's grace, then I would have to say, well, you're saying one thing, but what you really are is something else. You're really not unified. You're really not bringing people together, even though you might say, well, we don't judge people. We're just bringing everybody together in one, uh, in one place. We're believing something. Being, being together is not unity. Being together does not mean that you have unity. I remember in, uh, um, uh, on occasions we went to some unity movements, so-called unity movements, and there's people from all these different so-called faiths and they're all together, so therefore they're, they're, they say we have unity. But the very next day they go and worship in different places, indicating that they don't have unity. There are divisions among them. Now, friends, how can someone say that they want a unity and then turn around and have divisions? See, Paul said no divisions. 
And no divisions are going to happen when you speak the same thing. Notice, one speech and one mind. Again, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 <clears throat> and verse 10. Paul said, By the name of Jesus Christ, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Now, friends, speak the same thing, no divisions, perfectly joined together in the same mind, same judgment. Now, you think about this. If we're speaking the same thing, that is we're accomplishing, we're going for the same goal. We're teaching the same thing. We're believing the same thing. Paul said in Romans 15, Romans 15 and verse uh, 6, Notice he says that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. And friends, I can assure you on the first day of the week on Sunday or any given day of the week when people assemble together to, uh, to worship God or to, uh, to, to speak, to teach, that they are not of one mind and not glorifying God with one mouth. If you are speaking with one mind and one mouth, that means you're all speaking the same thing. You're all saying the same thing. You're all believing the same thing. You're teaching the same thing. But friends, you and I know, I mean, you just have to be a, 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 a total dunce, maybe, I don't know, oblivious to the truth to say that everybody believes and teaches the same thing and is speaking the same thing. Can you imagine someone coming and saying, well, we all believe the same thing. When it's obviously that you teach something different on even the basic things, basic things. The most obvious things we don't agree on. How about this? How many differences are there when it comes to homosexuals? How, how many differences are there? Someone says, well, you know, I think they're okay. Other churches, some churches are letting them in. The Presbyterian Church, uh, the USA, the big, the big one. Now, they allow uh, homosexuals. They allow homosexuals marriage. They, uh, I think they allow them to be clergy. I, I don't uh, know all the different, maybe, varying tenets of how they accept them, but they're accepted. I know the Episcopalian, the Episcopal Church allows it, the, uh, uh, the Anglican Church, I think the Eastern Orthodox Church, they allow it. You know, they got the gay bishops and, and everything. They're all, they're all in. Of course, you have all kinds of uh, unity churches and non-denominational, interdenominational, we don't know what we're called, denomination churches that allow it and they're, they're advocating and it's okay for, for homosexuals to be the preachers, but on other churches they say, well, we'll allow homosexuals, but we won't let them be preachers. I think the Methodist church will allow homosexuals, uh, but maybe they won't allow se uh, homosexuals to be uh, uh you can't perform a homosexual marriage, but you can help the homosexuals get married. You just can't have get married in the churches or whatever, church buildings, whatever. I don't know. It's all mixed up. But my point is, it's because there are differences on how to deal with the, uh, uh, the sin of homosexuality. And so we're being bombarded by, well, churches have to let them in. Churches can't, can't uh, refuse them, whatever. Now, here's my point, friends, on, on something, on something as, as fundamental and obvious as a sin which God condemns. If we can't be in agreement on homosexuality as being a sin, when God clearly says, when God clearly says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, When Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived that neither fornicators, there's homosexuals, neither idolaters, nor adulterers, that could be homosexuals, nor effeminate, that's definitely a homosexual, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, that's a homosexual, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. When the Bible clearly says that you cannot inherit the kingdom of God, if we can't agree on something as simple and fundamental as that, Please tell me how in the world we're going to be unified on all the other things. I mean, we can't get that right. If we can't get that right, how can there be unity on everything else? 
See that? I mean, that's so obvious. That's so obvious. But Paul says unity is going to come when we're speaking the same thing, minding the same things. Friends, do you know why? You know why people don't speak the same things when it comes to, to what the Bible says? You know why they all have their different takes on their different interpretations on it? And they all say, well, we can't understand the Bible a lot, so we're going to understand it our own way, and yet we're going to say that we're all, all together. You know why? Because they really don't understand Christ. They really don't understand unity when it comes to Christ. Now, in this text that we're looking at in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to notice what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, <clears throat> in, verse, in verse 13. Here's what Paul says. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, It's been declared unto to me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, Every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So what they were doing is they were saying, well, we're following all these different men, and therefore we're, we're all divided, but they're still saying we're all unified. Oh, we're all members of the same church, but yet we're following different men, and we're doing little things differently because of the person that taught us or the person that taught us the gospel, so forth. But notice what Paul, what Paul says. He asks this question. Is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? Now the problem was, these Corinthians were following these different men. Maybe one of them liked Paul because, uh, uh, you know, he was a, 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 an apostle and uh, maybe an apostle not like Peter. Peter was an apostle, uh, one of the first apostles, original apostles and and so maybe someone liked Peter because of that. I mean, he actually lived with Jesus, walked with Jesus, spent time with Jesus in person, whereas Paul didn't. So they liked Peter, Cephas, better than Paul. Maybe someone liked uh, Apollos because, man, he was eloquent. You know, Acts 18 says he was an eloquent man, mighty in Scripture. Boy, he could, he could speak. Boy, he's a, he, was a good, he was a good speaker. You know, he was kind of like, uh, he's a good-looking guy. I don't know. I'm sure he had pretty white teeth and slick back hair. And, you know, he, just, he was eloquent. I don't know. I doubt he was like that. He wasn't like Joel Osteen. He preached differently than Joel Osteen, that's for sure. But maybe they liked him because he was a good talker, good, good speaker, eloquent, mighty in Scripture. And so they liked Paul for another reason. And Paul says, look, you're all following these guys. They're all preaching the same thing, but you're dividing yourself amongst, uh, uh, dividing yourself up based upon what people are saying following these real men. But today what we have is we have people following men who are speaking different things. Well, let me tell you, if you can't have unity because people are following Paul, Apollos, or Cephas, and they're speaking the same thing, preaching the same thing, but yet they're making a distinction to the point that they don't have unity, if unity is so precious that you can't have people following these kind of men, what does it say about someone who comes along and says, well, I'm following chief apostle over here in, in Danville, and I'm following right Reverend over here in Martinsville, and I'm following uh, Chief Elder Bishop number seven over here in Reedsville. What does that say about them who are all teaching different things? One person's following the apostle over here, and he's in the apostolic church. One following right Reverend so and so, and he's in the Baptist church. Someone else is following the Pentecostal over here. Listen. If you can't divide up amongst people who are teaching the same thing and make a distinction and make a division without being criticized or condemned by Paul, I guarantee you, you can't divide up and follow different men teaching different things and still say you have unity. And the reason why people today are divided up is because they divided Christ up. Paul said, is Christ divided? That word means portioned out. Now think about that, friends. The denominations have portioned out Jesus. I can assure you, if I ask, if I ask people, well, do you follow Jesus? Oh, yeah, I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. Well, what church are you in? I'm in the Baptist church. I ask someone, do you follow Jesus? Oh, I follow Jesus. What church are you in? I'm in the Methodist church. You ask someone, are you, do you follow Jesus? Oh, I follow Jesus. What church are you in? I'm in the church of Latter-day Saints. Someone else is following Jesus in the Pentecostal church. Someone else is following Jesus in the Lutheran church. Someone else is following Jesus in the Apostolic church. 
Now what they've done is they've divided up Christ. They've portioned him out. Here's how the word is used. Look at this. In Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 3 and verse 24. Jesus said, if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. There's the word divided. If a house was divided against itself, that house cannot stand. <clears throat> so here's how we're talking. Here's the word we're using, divided. It's the same word that was used when Jesus took the five loaves and the fishes and divided it up and, and, and gave it out to the people. So they're, they're taking Jesus and they're dividing him up. So when someone says, well, Jesus and all these different denominations that are speaking different things and teaching different things, minding different things, there's no unity in them. You're dividing Jesus up. And Paul says, is Christ divided? Well, the answer is no, but denominations, they say, oh, he must be divided. See, denominations divide up all, the, all uh, Jesus amongst all these different religions. Friends, that's not unity. Jesus is not divided. But if all the divided up people come to follow Jesus, then they think he is divided. See, you don't even know, you don't understand about Jesus. Jesus is not divided up. He's not chopped up. Yeah, I got him chopped up like old Samuel did King Agag. Go back and read 1 Samuel 15, about verse 33 somewhere. Saul was supposed to kill King Agag. All the Amalekites utterly destroyed him, and he saved King Agag and, and the best of the flock. And when Samuel came down, he walked over to Agag, and the Bible says he hewed him, hewed him in pieces. He cut him up in pieces. And that's what y'all are doing to Jesus. When you say Jesus in all these different denominations that the Bible never speaks of, <clears throat> the Bible never talks about, speaking different things, someone says homosexuality is all right, someone says uh, uh, baptism is sprinkling, someone over here says, well, we got to get filled with the Holy Spirit and run on the floor and that crazy. Someone else says, oh, no, you know, we got to... Uh, speak in tongues, someone else says uh, <clears throat> women preachers, someone else says uh, worship on Friday or Saturday or whatever, all speaking different things. You know what you've done? You've divided up Jesus. That's exactly what you've done. You chopped him up, cut him up, divided him up. No, that's not unity. That's not unity. Speak the same things. Have one speech, one mind, and one Christ. Now watch what Paul says next. When Paul gets back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he then says, is Christ divided, right? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Now why did Paul talk about being crucified? In the context of talking about unity. The reason he did that, friends, is because people, all people, are going to be redeemed only by the cross. Now, not everybody's not going to be redeemed, but if somebody's going to be redeemed, it's going to be redeemed by the cross, by the blood that was shed on the cross. In Matthew 26 and verse 28, Matthew 26 and verse 28, Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus came to give his life a ransom for many. So it is the cross that's going to redeem everybody. It's the cross that's going to unify. Paul said in Ephesians 1 verse 7, let's look at another verse here. Ephesians 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. His blood was shed on the cross. Redeemed by the cross, by the blood on the cross. Now, if Christ is divided, then you have to divide up the cross. Because Christ shed his blood on the cross. Now, if the blood is going to sanctify and save all these different people and all these different groups, then you've got to divide up the cross. You've got to divide up the blood that was shed on the cross. But see, the cross is where Christ purchased the church. 
In Acts 20 and verse 28, Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul tells the elders of Ephesus, he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Now, friend, here's my question. I want you to, I want you to think with me. If the cross is where Christ purchased the church with his blood, what cross was Christ on when he purchased your man-made church? Which cross? Which cross was Christ on when he purchased the Baptist church? Which cross was he on when he purchased the Lutheran church or the Presbyterian church? Which cross was he on? See, there's only one cross and there's only one church. Therefore, the blood was shed on the one cross. Christ was crucified on that one cross and shed his blood to purchase the one church. You see, unity, unity has to come based upon one Christ and one cross. But you're out here in the denominations, friends, and you're saying, well, Jesus died on the cross for my church. Wait a minute. Your church is not even mentioned in the Bible. How do you know Jesus purchased your church on the cross when your church is not even mentioned in the Bible? And yet you want to say, well, we have unity. Well, I would ask as Paul asked. Was Christ crucified for your church? Paul said, Paul asked, was he crucified for them? You know why? Because they're saying, well, we're following Paul. And I could ask the same question. Was, was your pastor, did your pastor, was, did he, was he crucified for your church? The man who started your church, and they were all started by a man, friend. These churches of men were all started by a man. He founded their church, and then they died. Or maybe in a woman. Mary Baker, uh, uh, Eddie, or, or Ellen G. White, they, start, they all started their churches. They started their own religious groups, and then they died. They didn't hang on the cross for it. We talk, the Bible talks about the cross of Christ. I'd like to know where the cross of Joseph Smith is. Where's the cross of Ellen G. White? Where's the cross of Charles Taz Russell? Where's the cross of Mino Simons? Where's the cross of John Smythe, founder of the Baptist Church? Where, where's, where, where's, the cross? where's their cross? See, because in order to have a church, then you have to have a cross and you have to have the Savior died on it. Well, Jesus only died on one cross for one church. Now, you claim you want to have unity. You claim you want to have unity. But in order to do it, you chop up Jesus and chop up his cross. If you say cross is divided amongst all the different kinds of churches, then you're saying the cross is divided. And Paul says, no, I wasn't crucified for you. And friends, you know what? Neither was your pastor. Neither was the founder of your religion. No man was ever crucified for his church and then rose again the third day. No one ever did. Nobody was crucified for those churches. But yet, they prefer to be called Christians, don't they? When you talk about Christianity, everybody lumps everybody together. Oh, we're all together. <clears throat> Listen to a guy on the radio the other day. And he was talking about this group of people that came together to sing, to sing this, make this Christmas album of these Christmas songs, right? And he says, well, they're all Christians from different faiths. What? They're all Christians from different faiths? Really? Is, was Christ divided? Was somebody, was, did, was Christ crucified for all the different churches that didn't even come into existence until at least six or seven hundred years after he died, after he went back to heaven? Really? See what I'm saying? Now they prefer to say, well, we're all Christians. 
Well, you may prefer that. But you're not Christians, friends. You cannot be a Christian and be in a church that Christ didn't buy. That he didn't shed his blood for. That he didn't hang on the cross for. You cannot be a Christian and be in a man-made church. It's just not possible, friend. It's just not possible. So to say, well, we, we want unity. We want unity, but, uh, you know, we, we, we want to be divided. That's not, that's not, that's not uh, unity. If you have more than one kind of church, you're going to have to have more than one kind of cross. Then look what Paul says. All in the context, all in the context of unity here. All in the context of unity. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and verse 13. 10, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 13, sorry. Was Christ divided? No, Christ not divided. Was a man crucified for you? No. Only, there's only one cross. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, this is really going to show where there's a lot of division. What is Paul doing talking about baptism when he's trying to get these folks to be unified? He's discussing unity. He's talking about speaking the same thing, minding the same thing. He talks about one cross. Oh, yeah, there's one cross. He talks about one cross. Oh, yeah, there's one cross. Then he says, was Paul, was, were you baptized in the name of Paul? What are you talking about baptism for, Paul? Because baptism has a connection to unity as well, friends. Because baptism is connected to the cross, <clears throat> it's connected to the blood, and it's connected to the church because it's connected to Christ. See, Paul understands what a lot of people today don't. <clears throat> Unity is going to come if you're baptized in the name of or by the authority of Christ. Now, I know there's a lot of division on that very subject because a lot of people will say, oh, no, no, you don't need to be baptized. I mean, there's a whole lot of talk about baptism. The Baptist is going to say you got to be immersed, but you don't have to be immersed to get to heaven. But you do have to be immersed to get into the Baptist church. The Methodists are going to say, well, you can be immersed. You can, be, you can have water sprinkled on you, or you can have water poured on you. All of them are going to say, oh, no, you just got to be baptized in the Spirit. You, you know, and you just, if you want to be baptized in water, it's, it's an option, you know. So there's a lot of division right there. But the reason why Paul mentions baptism is because of of the connection that it has with the cross and with the blood and with the church. Listen, baptism for the remission of sins was commanded by Christ. It's commanded by Christ. In Mark 16, 15 and 16, Mark 16, 15 and 16, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, friends, I just don't know how you get around this. Jesus commanded them to go and preach the gospel. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, why would anybody want to be baptized after hearing the gospel preached? It must be because when you hear the gospel preached, what is going to be preached is, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. You can't preach the gospel the pure gospel, the unifying gospel, without preaching this. So, why would Paul say, will you baptize the name of Paul? Because he knows baptism of the, of the Great Commission, baptism of the gospel was commanded by Christ. That is, it was done in his name or by his authority. Now, today you have people say, well, Christ, you know, you don't have to. Well, I can tell right now we're divided on that. If you don't believe that Christ commanded baptism for the remission of sins, then you're already dividing and splitting away from Christ. This is a, this is a big dividing point right here for a lot of people. They, they won't do anything but get in the water. I think they're hydrophobic. 
They got rabies. And when you talk to them about baptism, boy, they get foaming at the mouth too. Sometimes I think that's what they are. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 and 19, look what he says. He said, all authority, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. So he has all authority. And he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Who gave them the authority to preach this? Jesus Christ. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Here was the command that Jesus authorized. Go teach and baptize. Now friends, if we're differing on that, then there's no way we can have unity. And I know that a majority of the religious world is probably going to be unified on what they believe about baptism. They believe it's not essential, and they're going to be unified on that one point. But that doesn't mean they're unified with God. They're not unified with Christ. The reason why Paul says you were not baptized in my name or you were not baptized by my authority is because they were saying they were following Paul. And Paul says, no, unity is going to come when you start following Jesus. Don't be following me. You weren't baptized in my name. Well, in whose name were they baptized then? Who were these Corinthians? Whose name were they baptized in? By whose authority were they baptized in? Christ. That's why Paul said that. He said, you weren't baptized in my name, by my authority. You were baptized in the name of Christ. And the reason why is because they were baptized into the death of Christ. This is why baptism is so important. Unity is going to come when people obey the gospel that will put them all in the same place. In Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, <clears throat> Paul says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Did you not know that? There's a lot of people that do not know this. That baptism, obeying the gospel, and being baptized according to the scripture puts them into Christ. So I know they're not in Christ because they don't believe baptism is essential. Therefore I know they were not baptized into his death. But Paul says to the Romans, who were obedient to the gospel, Romans 6 and verse 17, he's going to say you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So they obeyed this. He says, don't you know that when you obeyed this form of doctrine that what you did was you were baptized into the death of Christ? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that, the, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Why would Paul say that? Why would Paul say that? Because baptism is what connects you to the death of Christ and the cross of Christ. And it is the door into the church. Now friends, we're, we're staying with unity here. Unity comes when people obey the gospel that was commanded by Christ, that it was what was authorized by Christ. They'll wind up in the body of Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27 Galatians 3, verse 27. Paul says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That is, when you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into the body of Christ. As many of you as have been baptized into the body of Christ have put on Christ. How do I know that? Well, if you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into his body. Paul said in Ephesians 1, and verse 22 and 23, God gave Christ to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. So being baptized into Christ 
is being baptized into his body or being baptized into his church. And there's only one. Now again, how can all these different religious groups, all the denominations, churches of men, how can they be divided on what they say without dividing up Christ? They can't be. And if they've divided up Christ, they've divided up the cross. If they've divided up the cross, there's no way they can all be in one body. Now, I'm telling you, friends, if you want unity, like we want unity, that's why we're preaching about the one church. We're preaching about the one true church where a person must be in order to be saved. Christ is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5 and verse 23. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let uh, wives be to their own husbands and everything. Christ is the head of the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Now, you wonder why we don't have unity like the Bible talks about? It's because people don't really believe what Christ said. And the reason why they don't is because they think it doesn't make sense. They think, well, you know what? That, 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 that's foolish talk. Well, that's exactly what Paul says. Let's let's look quickly here at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 13, Paul says, Is Christ divided? No, Christ is not divided. So why are you all divided up? Was Paul crucified for you? No, a man wasn't crucified for you, so why are you all divided up? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, so why are you all divided up? You should have been baptized in the name of Jesus by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. But the reason why people today want to run around and try to get around baptism is because they really don't want unity. Now Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. And a lot of people say, well, hey, there it is right there, Paul. Paul wasn't sent to baptize. <clears throat> no, he was sent to preach the gospel. But preaching the gospel is preaching, be baptized for the remission of sins. So Paul preached that. Now can you imagine, can you imagine the apostle Paul preaching the Great Commission? He goes to all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. He says, he that believeth is baptized shall be saved, that he believeth not shall be damned. And someone comes to him and says, Paul, I don't want to be damned. I want to be baptized. I believe I want to be baptized so I can be saved. And Paul says, well, I can't do that because Christ sent me not to baptize. He sent me to preach. So you just out of luck. Because someone else comes along, I can't get my hands wet. What kind of preacher is that, that that tells you what you need to do to be saved and it won't help you? Paul said, I was not made an apostle to baptize. You don't need to be an apostle to baptize, but he did need to be an apostle to receive the revelation that was given him. Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. That's what he's talking about. So the gospel he preached was going to bring unity if people would follow it. But the reason why people today don't have the unity that, that God wants is because they really think that God's way is foolish. Look what Paul says. The preaching of the cross is in the prayer's foolishness. But to unto us which are saved is the power of God. And then he goes on to talk about how foolish man is to reject the wisdom of God. He says in verse 20, where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You know what Paul's doing? He's quoting from Isaiah 29, and he says this is the same way people in the Old Testament did. They looked at God's wisdom, they heard God's prophets, they heard God's wisdom, and they said, no, nah, that doesn't make sense, I'm not going to do it. And you know what people today do? They hear God's word, they hear God, they hear God say, he that believes in his baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And they go, oh, I don't, that doesn't make, make sense to me. They hear the Bible talk about the one body, the one church, and they go, no, that doesn't make sense to me. I think we ought to be able to divide it up. And that's exactly what, what, what happens. They're, they're foolish. They're foolish for rejecting God's wisdom. They think they know more than God. Friends, if you're in a, if you're in a church that, that's not in this book, you can't find the kind of church you're in in this book you're the foolish one. 
You think you know more than God. Christ is the Savior of the body. He did not say anything about the churches you're in, that you're all divided up in, that he's going to save them. He didn't say anything about that. He's not going to save them, friend. I'm trying to help you out. He's not going to save them. But yet, man comes along and says, you know what, I'm going to divide up Jesus. I'm going to chop him up, and I'm going to say that he's in all these churches. And then I'm going to chop up his cross so that I can say, well, this church was sanctified by the blood that was shed on the cross for this particular man-made church. No. Man wants to divide it up. Man wants to say, oh, well, the church of Christ. It's all these different churches. Nope. Speaking different things. There's no way, there's no way you can be unified and have the unity that God wants. So here's what I think, friends. I think when it really gets right down to it, you are not unified. You don't really see unity. All these unity movements and unity groups that that people want to be a part of, and they they come together and think that all oh, we're we're loving God. <clears throat> we're all, we're just going to come together and ignore our differences and just say, "Well, God is love." You're not really you're not really trying to get unity. You're not really seeking unity. You just want us to think that's what you are. You just like the KKK. You, you prefer people to think of you as being some kind of big unifier and let's bring everybody together and we all love everybody. But you're just like the KKK. You just want us to call you one thing when really you're something else. And given the fact that you all speak different things, you teach different things, you practice different things. You didn't obey the form of doctrine that you find in this book. If you did, you wouldn't become a member of a man-made church. So you want us to think that, oh, yeah, we all, we're all loving Jesus. We're all in this together. Well, why don't you just prefer what you really are? Really, you're not unifiers. You know what you are? You're separatists. Let's just change this headline. Denominations prefer to be called separatists. That's really what you are. That's really what you are. You're no different than the KKK. You want people to see you as one thing that you're really not. Why don't you just come out and say what you really are? We are separatists. We want to, we want to worship God our own way. We want to divide Jesus up. We want to say our own thing and do our own thing, and we're not really concerned about what God says because it just doesn't make sense to us. I know it doesn't make sense to you, friends, because just like what Paul said, Paul said, the wisdom of God, after the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save them to believe. You know, who, you know who's going to be saved? The folks who are going to be saved are the ones who are foolish enough to believe God and reject what man says. But man comes along and says, oh, that's just not smart enough, you know. Come up with all kinds of different ideas about what the Bible says. Like Mr. Uh, Ralph Law saying, well, we know in Acts 2, 38, that's not water baptism because in the time of in Acts 2, 38, there wasn't any water in Jerusalem. Well, you so smart, you just talked yourself right out of the truth, didn't you? And you can't, and you can't get them to see it. People are so ingrained with what men have taught them that when you tell them the truth, when you show them the wisdom of God's word, you know what they do? They laugh at you, they scoff at you, and they go, oh, that's foolishness. That's foolishness. They're so smart. They're so smart that they mock at the truth. You know in Acts 17 verse 18? Acts 17 and verse 18. <clears throat> the folks in Athens, the Bible says certain philosophers of the Epicurean. You know what philosophers are? They're lovers of wisdom, lovers of knowledge, lovers of wisdom. And they said, they encountered Paul and they said, some said, what will this Babylon say? Others say he seemed to be a set of the strange gods because he preacheth unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, and the resurrection. They said, well, let's see what he has to say. So they took him up and they listened to what he had to say. And when you come down to <clears throat> the resurrection, when Paul got to the resurrection of the dead, 
Notice, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again in this matter. There's a lot of people who are mocking and scoffing at the truth because it just doesn't make sense to them. Friends, it doesn't make sense or you'd be baptized in water. Well, how, how silly is that? Friends, I didn't make it up. God said it. I'm just a fool enough to do what God says. I'm foolish enough to say, you know what? I can't be saved by myself. I can't devise my own way. You're the fool who thinks you're smarter than God. Friends, I'm out of time. Uh, well, I don't know if I have time. All right. You're on the word of the Lord. you got just a few seconds. Yeah. Go ahead. You're on. I'm uh, Joe Codd up in uh, Danville. Yes, sir. On Aunt Boulevard. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you're going to make any CDs of the show you got tonight. Sure can. Uh, if you stay on the line, let me get your name and address, and I'll uh, get one to you. Okay. Okay. Will, okay. You, will you stay on the line? Yeah, I'm on the line. Okay. D stay on hold. I'll put you on hold, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Uh-huh. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> once a copy of it, we'll be glad to get that out to you. Friends, I also want to say, too, uh, Bible Correspondence Course. If you would like a Bible Correspondence Course, if you will simply let me know, if you'll simply uh, write to me at wordfromthelord.gmail.com or give me a call, 276-340-2653. We'll get you a, a Bible Correspondence Course, 10 lesson series. We'll get that out to you. You can take it in the privacy on your home and send it back to us. We'll grade it and send you another one. <clears throat> but if we can help you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Friends, thanks for watching. We hope that you will be wise enough to simply do what God says and uh, make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.